Hey everyone, um, welcome to week five. We will be starting off with learning before um, later on with lectures talking about incentives and um, attribution and control. Um, but with learning, we are kind of adding on to that holes drive theory where we talked about habits. And so we're gonna be talking about how habits are learned through reinforcements. Um, with this, it'll include um, operating in classical conditioning. Those are always pretty fun topics. Um, so we'll have some interesting examples for those. And then we'll also discuss um, vicarious learning. So learning um, socially, things like that. So yeah, starting off with operant conditioning here. So a lot of people think that this starts with um, B.F. Skinner and Skinner certainly has played a large role in the research on this topic, but this actually stems from Thorndike's law of effect. Um, basically the idea here is that reward strengthens the stimulus um, response relationship. So reward or reinforcement here. So stimulus occurs and then we um, you know, respond however we respond to that um, stimulus in the environment. And then if that behavior is rewarded or reinforced, um, this bond should strengthen and the response um, should be repeated. And so, yeah, the general um, law of effect is essentially that responses that are rewarded tend to be repeated, rewarded or reinforced. And um, we'll talk about kind of the reinforcement punishment distinction. Um, and then unreinforced, so either nothing happens or punished responses should decrease. So operant conditioning, um, there are some pretty common, I think, misconceptions about what um, reinforcement really is and the difference between punishment and reinforcement. And so basically it all comes down to either adding or removing a um, positive or negative stimulus. Um, so let's say we're trying to um, motivate a child to do their homework, right? Um, we could add a positive stimulus in order to try and increase the behavior when the homework is done. Um, additionally, we could make it so that there are no more chores or remove a negative stimulus that is also rewarding and should um, support that behavior or strengthen um, that bond and increase the homework um, that the child is doing. We could also um, act when the child does not do the homework. And so this can look like um, adding a negative stimulus. Um, this could be grounding the child, um, you know, time out, you name it. I think a lot of common punishments that we can think of um, would fit in this category. However, um, we can also remove something that that child likes, such as uh, making it so that there's no TV. And so that's just an example here um, of operant conditioning. I think that this, at least research-wise, a lot of this has been done with either animals or children. But you can think about how this, I mean, this also easily applies to adults, right? Like maybe um, switch out some of the um, reinforcements or punishments here, but I mean, maybe don't ground yourself um, if you don't do your homework for this class, but still try, you can think of ways where um, this might apply to you. Like if you um, are getting your things done as scheduled, you could um, add something positive, give yourself, you know, some time to relax or to do what you like doing. Um, or you could, I mean, this applies to adults too, I guess, making it so that you don't have to do your chores around the house because you did so um, well with your schoolwork that day. Um, yeah, things like that. Just want to point out because I know that a lot of this and a lot of the examples um, that we'll talk about do are more, um, include more animals and children than adults, but this is definitely um, still 
applicable for adults as well. Um, so just want to also go over what these are called um, in the realm of operant conditioning. And so I think this, the most common misconception I think is likely the um, negative reinforcement. Cause I think we hear the word negative and think, oh, that's, that's a bad thing. It must be, um, you know, that must be some kind of punishment, but it's not. So when we add um, a positive stimulus, that's called positive reinforcement. That should increase be the behavior. So that's the cookie in the previous, previous example. Um, negative reinforcement is taking away something that the individual doesn't like. So, um, you know, chores was the example of that. There are um, two types of punishment here. There's adding um, a negative stimulus. So, I don't know. Um, making the... Yeah, just make it, having the individual um, do something that they don't necessarily want to do, um, things like that. Or you can remove something positive that's called punishment type two. Um, and the last example, that would be um, removing the TV time, right? And so all in all, a reinforcement is generally um, a way of increasing the behavior, whereas punishment should decrease the behavior. Um, there's also an important distinction in operant conditioning between primary and secondary or conditioned reinforcers. So primary reinforcers, these are things um, that we need like food, water, things like that. Conditioned reinforcers are objects that are or sounds or whatever it might be that are associated with the primary reinforcer. So you'll see certain examples, uh, make sure to watch the videos that we'll go through, but one of them um, has a clicker for a dog. That's an example of a secondary or, or a conditioned um, reinforcer. Reinforcements can happen on uh, various schedules. Um, it's not always the same. And so watch this video, this gets into some Skinner research about, um, it'll just demonstrate the use of some of these different uh, reinforcement schedules, but basically we can um, influence or reinforce behavior by giving a reward or reinforcement after a certain number of behaviors of correct behaviors, and that would be a ratio, or we can reward or reinforce after a certain amount of time, and this would be an interval. And so um, with fixed, we'll go through an example in the next slide, but with fixed, that's just either a certain number of behaviors and you get a reward or interval, that's a certain amount of time. And if the behavior is done during that amount of time, then um, the reward is given. Um, variable, similar idea, right? It's just that the either the number of behaviors or the time amount of time isn't exactly known, it fluctuates. So um, let's use an example here and train this good doggo to um, shake hands. So going through these four different types of schedules, right? So with a fixed ratio, we could do something like every three times the dog shakes your hand, it gets a treat. And I think that this is pretty common. It might typically work pretty well. There are some potential drawbacks to this, which the main one being the possibility of unwanted excessive behavior. So if you're going for more of like a regulation, but not, you don't want this every time or all the time, it might not be the best. What you might get from this is every waking moment, your dog's gonna want that treat, right? So it's going to just come up to you, try to get you to shake hands all the time to get that treat. Um, potentially, uh, potentially a better way of going about this would be a fixed interval. So remember, that's the time period. And so this would just involve after two days have passed or, you know, one day, whatever it is, as long as it's a fixed amount of time, the dog gets a treat um, as long as the um, wanted behavior is done during that time period. Right. And then we could also um, do uh, work with variable schedules here. And so 
variable ratio instead of that fixed ratio or three time um, for the behavior every time we could mix it up um, and randomly you know make it so that every two to four times your dog shakes your hand it gets a treat or we could also do a variable interval um, where after uh, one to three days have passed the dog gets a treat upon shaking your hand and so I like this, this example um definitely a dog person um this is not my dog but that'd be nice but anyways this same type of idea um, can certainly apply with humans, right? Like if you're thinking about um, if you have kids and you want the kids to do your chore, to do their chores around the house, you know. Um, so if you want the, um, your kid to do the laundry, you can, you know, give your kid some type of reinforcement like a cookie or, um, you know, a couple of dollars or whatever after every time that kid does the laundry or after every couple of times the kid does the laundry. The same type of issue might come up here, right? In terms of, well, if you're um, giving your kid um, a reward for every time your kid does that chore, you might be uh, coming home to your kid washing, you know, every sock separately or something, right? To <laughs> get, a, get that reward for doing the laundry every time. Um, and so, the fixed interval um, might be a good idea here, here too, um, but it does, you know, situational, situation dependent, um, depends what you're going for. And we'll talk about this more on this slide. Some um, results here are some averages for how well these reinforcement schedules work. So we have, um, this is those ratios, right? So really um, both of these, work very well in terms of pretty quickly increasing behavior frequency and pretty rapidly too, right? Um, and so, especially with that variable ratio, but with that fixed ratio as well, that's still a pretty steep increase there. Um, but with this, we see kind of a step function or aspect here, right? Um, that's due because once you uh, do the certain amount of behaviors, right? And you get the reward, then you know that it will be quite a few behaviors um, before you get that reward again, right? And so that um, gets to explaining why this step effect occurs versus with the interval schedules, the, these um, increase behavior frequency at a less rapid rate, right? Um, and we still see the... Um, step function with the fixed interval as well. Uh, like we see it with the fixed ratio, it's just um, a bit less of a steep incline there um, and definitely less of a steep uh, increase in behavior frequency for this variable interval. Intervals are really good um, in general when we are looking to get some kind of regularity with the behavior, right? But then not, um, when we don't want the behavior to get out of control or extremely frequent, that's when we're going to want to use these intervals typically. Um, when we don't want, you know, the child to be washing every other sock um, by itself, or when we um, don't want the dog to be coming up to us every two seconds to shake hands, or if you want that, um, that's fine. Then you probably want the ratio. Um, but it's just to point out that which is which schedule is the most successful it really depends on what you want out of it. Um, final slide on this topic here. So shaping with shifting criterion. Um, so the strategy here for reinforcing behavior is um, the shifting criterion. This uh, strategy is good for more complicated behaviors. And so in this example, Skinner and an assistant train this dog to open a trash can, which why this behavior was picked, I have no idea. Um, it doesn't, it seems like one of the last things to me that you'd wanna teach your dog to do. But anyways, um, the idea here is that you start with rewarding the behavior um, when, just when, um, you know, wh wh whoever or whatever animal is being trained gets close. And so as you can see here in the first five minutes, um, the reward, or, uh, yeah, the reward is coming 
uh, um, just when the dog is getting close to the trash can, right? And then as you get into the nine minute, 13 minute, 17 minute range, now it's got to start kind of pawing at the trash can to get a reward. So it's getting closer um, and getting closer is being reinforced until finally this 20 minute mark. Well, now the dog has to really press the pedal and actually open the trash can in order to get that reinforcement. Um, and watch this video. This um, is a very good example of training a dog using um, shaping with, with shifting criterion. And it also is a good example of the secondary or conditioned reinforcer that we talked about um, previously. And so in this example, the dog's being trained with a clicker. So that is it for um, operant conditioning. In the next video, we will get into um, classical conditioning and all the um, Pavlov stuff and yeah.